Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, sorry about the few minutes of a late start. We're having some video connection issues. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. I'm going to give a brief introduction before I uh, introduce Dr. Spangello. So, first of all, um, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Victoria, so, and I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing speaker today. I'm a member of the IDEA group and um, within GRSS, and I'm the co-lead of our IDEA Women Mentoring Women group. So first, I want to thank Sarah for agreeing to dedicate her time for this talk. She not only is dedicating her time, but she also responded to my cold call LinkedIn message. <laughs> so her being here today already embodies what it means to be a woman supporting another woman in the field. So today's event um, is hosted by the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. So GRSS is a professional society that brings together a community of researchers and practitioners working together in the field of geoscience and remote sensing. If you aren't a member, I highly recommend joining. Um, there's a lot of membership benefits and you also can become a part of our Women Mentoring Women program. And for students on this call, um, IEEE actually has a 50% off discount right now for membership. So I'll put that in the link after the introduction. So the IDEA team within the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, which stands for Inspire, Develop, Empower, and Advance, runs a ton of great initiative to foster inclusivity and diversity within the field of remote sensing and geoscience. And one of these um, initiatives is our Women Mentoring Women program. Um, so before continuing, I'm really quickly just going to show you a, um, a short video. If you want to foster your field, you have to mentor. Now I feel I can bring the benefit to others. to know that you have positive impact on the young woman's career. These ladies are finding challenges and they are working and overcoming them. Then I might as well start fighting mine now. Our program works to connect women across all stages of their careers in the field of remote sensing and geoscience and provides a structured program to support mentor-mentee pairs. Um, I now co-lead the program, but in 2017, I was a mentee in the program, and I can't stress how amazing and important it was to have somebody outside of my regular academic circle to um, provide support. So if you are a woman on this call and you are in the field, I highly recommend joining. I'll also post a link. Um, good mentors are really, really hard to find. So um, if you are feel like you could be a mentor to somebody in the field, uh, please consider joining. So this brings me to why we're all here today. Um, women in the field of geosciences and remote sensing often face greater challenges in career advancement than their male peers. Um, this makes mentorship and creating a community so important. Dr. Sarah Spangello is a woman pushing boundaries in the field of remote sensing and is an inspiring woman to look up to. She's the co-founder and CEO of Swarm Technologies and is currently a senior director of satellite engineering at SpaceX. Um, previous to Swarm, Dr. Spangello worked on small satellites and autonomous aircrafts at the University of Michigan um, and was a lead systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, and Google X. Her background is in modeling and optimize, optimizing satellite constellations to maximize commercial impact and business opportunities. Uh, she re received her PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and in 2017 was a top 32 Canadian astronaut candidate. Um, during her talk, please write your questions in the Q&A and after we're going to get to all these questions as much as we can in the allotted hour. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Sayas Spangello for her talk titled Bringing Space Down to Earth. 
Thank you, Vicki, and, and nice to be here and, and see all of you or hear all of you. Unfortunately, my video isn't working, so you'll just hear my voice, but you'll see some photos of me throughout this. Um, so that was a great intro. Um, I'll run through a little bit of my kind of career path and hobbies and some of my advice, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Swarm, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, so my background, um, I grew up and I was born and grew up in the same house in Winnipeg. Um, and I grew up very, very kind of conventional um, family uh, situation, two little sisters. I did a lot of dancing and swimming and playing Legos when I was little. There's some photos of me and my little sisters um, building some sort of structure um, and then me doing ballet. Um, my parents are actually both civil engineers. My grandpa was a mechanical engineer. So there was a lot of engineering focus um, in my household. And that was just kind of part of the day to day. Um, I also didn't think it was weird for women to be engineers because my mom is one. Um, so that was kind of a, a cool thing growing up. Um, I got to attend space camp um, in Montreal when I was in grade eight. Um, and that was a huge, had a huge impression on my life. And I really came away from that experience wanting to be an astronaut and work in space. Um, and I think that inspired a lot of the future um, academic and career moves that I made. I first started studying physics and astronomy at the University of Manitoba. Um, and I was really um, resistant to going into engineering because I thought that was kind of lame that my parents and grandpa were both engineers or all engineers, um, but inevitably realized that that's really uh, where I would be able to make a big impact. Um, and there would be more kind of interesting and exciting career opportunities I felt in that field for me. So I switched into mechanical engineering and completed that degree at the University of Manitoba. Um, and then I applied to a bunch of grad schools in the US um, and in Canada. My parents didn't really understand what a graduate degree would get me. They were kind of like, you should get a job and buy a house and have a family and stay in Winnipeg. Um, but I felt there was probably uh, something more exciting I could do out there. So I actually secretly applied to a bunch of grad schools because the application fees were pretty expensive. I think it was $100 a school um, and I was spending my money on that um, and ended up getting into a few, interviewing at a few, um, and I felt Michigan was a good fit for me. I honestly didn't realize how good of a school it was. Um, I I remember seeing College of Engineering and thinking that that was like less than a university, but obviously Michigan is one of the top five or 10 engineering schools in the world. So I lucked out there. Um, and while I was there, I worked on satellites. You can see in the bottom right hand or bottom uh, right hand corner, my blonde uh, little bob there measuring the satellite um, in the wee hours of a night uh, or a morning before we were delivering that satellite that was gonna go into space. That was a really exciting period. Um, and then my research was focused on optimizing constellations. Um, and that was a, a really exciting period of life where I was able to do hands-on hardware and experimentation and testing and operations, um, and then also research. Um, and I, I finished there in uh, late 2012 and graduated in early 2013. And my career path after that. So I did seriously consider becoming a professor um, and I applied a few places. I had some offers, um, including um, at like University of Boulder and University of Manitoba and some other places. Um, but I ultimately decided that that probably wasn't gonna be the best career path for me. Um, I worked at NASA JPL for two and a half years. I was a lead systems engineer there and I worked on discovery class missions, which are the half billion dollar missions that go once every something like 10 years and then also small satellite missions. Um, and that was exciting because um, we being kind of the, the people that had graduated in like the 2010 era had had experience hands-on working on small satellites. And most people at JPL hadn't because their careers had, had just started way earlier and they hadn't had that opportunity. So it was cool being at JPL where some of the most senior people in the company were like, how do we build CubeSats? How do we do this? Um, and, and me and my peers were kind of experts. So that was a fun period. Um, after two and a half years, I transitioned over, well, I did some consulting in the meantime, and then I ultimately transitioned to Google X, which is Google's kind of research arm um, in the Bay Area. And I worked on Project Wing and proposed a secretive satellite project 
Um, and that was a, a, a very different experience from a more kind of a government focused one, very much, you know, build stuff, fly it, uh, let it touch the real world really quickly, learn from mistakes and iterate rapidly. So it was really fun to experience. Um, and then starting my own project within Google X gave me kind of an intrapreneurship, um, which is kind of internally doing entrepreneurship opportunity that really gave me the confidence to ultimately start Swarm. Um, and after a year there, um, my co-founder and myself had an idea of a small satellite network that would solve for connectivity. So we, we founded Swarm. Um, we were really lucky finding early investors and a, a huge support network and very organically started this company. I don't think we realized at the time really how ambitious the company would be. And we, we certainly didn't expect it to be as successful as it ultimately ended up being. You can see the satellite I'm holding there in my hand at the, in the top. Um, and it really is that small. It's about the size of a grilled cheese sandwich. And we've put up 120 of these satellites to create a low earth orbit network for providing low cost connectivity. And some of the other photos are, are my co-founder and, and me holding our term sheets and our whole team. Um, we grew that company for five years and I was the CEO and co-founder. And then uh, about three months ago in November, 2021, we uh, sold this company to SpaceX, uh, which is a really, a really good outcome for this company. Didn't expect it to be, to get sold. Didn't know that SpaceX would be interested, but ultimately all ended up working out. Um, and now I am a senior director at SpaceX um, and I'm working on many of the same programs and some new and exciting programs as well. So I feel really lucky that I've been able to span academia, government, industry, a really tiny startup from beginning. And SpaceX is actually still a startup. It's just a 10,000 person startup um, and it is still private. So I've had the opportunity to spend quite a lot in my about nine year career after grad school. I also have some fun hobbies that I thought it would be cool to talk about. So I have my pilot's license. I started that and finished it um, after I finished my PhD. That was kind of my reward to myself. You can see me in the bottom right there, trying to pretend that I'm flying <laughs> on the wing. Um, and then I did my instrument rating, which allows you to fly through clouds and is a very technical um, type of license that I think made me a much safer pilot. I did that a few years ago. I also did, did my scuba diving license. I love working out. That's how I manage a lot of my stress and anxiety. I travel a lot for work, but previously internationally for fun as well. Um, I like to mentor and advise. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to chat with you guys. Um, and you know, that childhood dream of becoming an astronaut, uh, there was an astronaut call for Canadians in 2017. Um, and when that came out, my dad was like, you have to apply, Sarah, this is your dream. So I applied and went through really fun um, kind of training and evaluation process. The bottom three photos on the left and, and middle are various tests that they put us through wearing these really dorky basketball jersey, jerseys, uh, a swim kind of uh, uh, challenge, I guess. And then the one on the second to the right there, I'm fixing the ISS underneath in some high pressure environment. So got to go through a bunch of fun and challenging um, experiences over multiple days, over multiple periods. And I didn't make it to the final cut, but I did make it to the top 32. Um, and that was a really amazing experience to be able to go through. So I was asked, you know, what is my career advice? Um, and I, I, I feel like I'm, also kind of in early phases of my career. So, um, you know, bear, bear with me. And, and these are like just the things I've learned so far. And I'm sure there's a lot of other really great advice out there. I, I kind of tried to stack rank these in kind of the order of my career. So when I was in grad school, you know, I really thought, what is my dream job? And my dream job was really to work at JPL and be a systems engineer in JPL as a NASA center in, um, in Southern California. I also wanted to live in California, being a Winnipeg girl and hating winters, um, I won't deny that. So I think it's really good to like, you know, either tell yourself, even if you're maybe a little bit shy to tell others, like really, where do I want to be in five or 10 or 20 years? And be honest with yourself and be ambitious. 
and then think about like, how do I need to get there? Because there's probably multiple steps, whether that's a certain degree or moving to a certain country or a certain internship or networking or building up your, um, your resume with the qualifications. But I recommend everyone just like take a quiet moment with themselves and think about what is their dream job and then setting those small and achievable goals to get there. And then I think, yeah, being honest about what experiences you might be lacking, whether it's around communications, is it a technical skill, a leadership, a management skill? One kind of interesting fact is that before I started Swarm, I've actually, I actually had never managed. I had mentored a lot of people, but I had never been like someone's official manager. Um, so that was just kind of a, a gap in my resume. And luckily I was able to kind of jump into it and hire people and and start to manage them. But I think I was pretty aware of that and I had looked for opportunities to at least mentor. So I had like a flavor of what that looked like. I think another key thing is asking for feedback and that's whether or not you're the CEO or you're the intern, like be, be really transparent with people. Hey, I love feedback on my performance. Do you think I'm meeting expectations? What could I be doing more of or less of to advance my career? And then really being open to working on those weaknesses. I think Every time you get feedback, even when I get feedback, it always stings for like, that, you know, for a few seconds. Oh man, that sucks. I, I hate that. And you kind of want to be defensive. But I think really accepting a feedback, especially if it's given with really nice intent. Um, and then being like, you're right, I could work on my communication or I could work on my, this technical skill or the clarity of my communication. Um, and that's really how you'll get better. And then asking for help or opportunities I think that, you know, my, my main motto is basically like, you'll never know if you don't ask. <laughs> and I had this experience even yesterday where I was proposing something for the SpaceX website and I threw out this thing and I said, this is a crazy idea, but I would love if we could put this on the website. And the reaction was actually like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, we can put that on the website. And I was like flabbergasted, but it reminded me like, if I hadn't asked, I wouldn't have gotten there. And it's same with if you need help or if you're looking for an opportunity, like help me, can you please help me figure out, you know, where there are internship opportunities or could I intern for you? Um, and yeah, just kind of leaning into that and being bold. I also think it's really important to think about where do I want to work? Um, and what, what's important to me from like the people, the culture, the environment, um, and, you know, I've had experiences in academia and government, which are relatively slow, but very rigorous. And the culture is generally very supportive, very positive, um, and, but, but it's slower. And then I've had experiences in startups where it can be really fast paced. Um, Swarm was, I believe, a very special culture because we built that from the ground up. But other startups can be a lot more cut throat and it can be like just about the work not about you know giving people all the love that they need so I think it's really important to figure out like what's important to you as a person and how, where you're going to thrive and thinking about those aspects of like are you going to be okay if your boss is like I need this done tonight and you have to work super super late to get it done or are you someone that you know really wants just you know a, a better life work balance so thinking about those things before you get too deep into your career, I think are pretty important. And it's okay to oscillate, you know, do academia and then do government and then do industry and then go back to one of the other. Um, but just thinking through, because I think those things actually tend to affect our day-to-day -day experience a lot more than say the work we're doing. I also like looking at, um, you know, what, what, is, what are the people five or 10 years more advanced in a career doing? And I remember when I was at JPL, I, I was lucky to become a, a systems engineer and have a pretty senior position and a, a big responsibility and authority pretty quickly in my career there. And I remember looking and seeing there were people that were near the end of their careers, maybe about to retire, that were doing the same job as me. And I really struggled with that because I couldn't really see what I would be doing in five or 10 years that would be like a big growth opportunity for me. So I think looking ahead and, and seeing like, do I want the job of my professor? Do I want the job of my boss or my boss's boss? What does their day-to-day -day look like? Um, it, you know, do I view that as like a, a way I wanna grow my career? And sometimes you have to take a big risk. Um, I think for me, that big risk in my career was 
uh, leaving Google and starting a startup. And I remember my mom was like flabbergasted that I would like leave Google at such a secure job and being well paid and everything. Um, but I think, you know, for me, I always think about safety nets. And um, I think women especially are less likely to take these like massive risks because they feel like they have to, you know, pay the bills and take care of people and, you know, be reliable and all those things. But I, I sometimes think of if you can visualize what your safety net is, maybe that's money that you've saved, maybe that's you have a supportive partner, maybe that's, you know, you could go back to your old job or get a new job without any problem. I think that makes it more comfortable for us to take risks. And for me, like I knew I could always go back to Google and I had a supportive partner at the time. Um, and that allowed me to take, you know, this really big risk in starting a startup. And then, you know, stuff gets hard. And I think, you know, especially having been through Swarm, like it's important that sometimes you have to accept that it's really hard and you just gotta be gritty <laughs> and stay in it and power through. Um, and life is hard and work is hard. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of things about our lives are hard and that doesn't mean we should quit. I think staying gritty and staying committed to what you are trying to build is really important. And then also tr trusting your gut. So for me, after five years of Swarm and the opportunity to sell to SpaceX, you know, I, I really sat with that for a long time of whether or not I wanted to kind of sell my baby essentially and what that would morph into. And for me, you know, just personally and professionally and for the company and the investors and the team and the technology, it felt like it was the right choice at the right time. And um, sometimes that's not even, that's not a super tangible decision. You know, it's not like a pros con thing. It's just a, I feel this is the right thing. And I think we just have to trust those instincts and kind of go for them. And then I was also asked about my mentorship advice. Um, and so I was actually chatting with one of my reports, um, Alicia, who helped me set this up and, and she's really amazing. And we've had a, a wonderful relationship over the past two years since she joined Swarm. And she was actually giving me ideas of ways she's felt I've mentored her. <laughs> uh, it was nice to kind of get her perspective on it. I think the main thing is really understanding people's motivations and passions. So why is this person at this company? What do they want to achieve? How can I help them get there? Maybe they're passionate about space or the environment or helping others. Um, and really understanding you know, where their internal motivation comes from, I think really helps you um, mentor them and, and help them advance in their careers. I always try to let my reports know that I support them fully. I have their back. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, I'm going to be there for them. I, I tend to give them a lot of space, mainly because at one point, I think I had like eight reports. <laughs> Just don't have the time to spend a lot of time micromanaging everybody. But giving them the space to go and explore, work independently, come to you with decisions, and building that trust over time. You know, they do something and you're like, that's great, keep going. You don't need to come back to me on this. And then they do something else and you're like, oh, we should really discuss this and let's make sure we're on the same page. And I think over time you can get calibrated and, and they can really work independently, which most people like working independently. Um, and it, I think setting them up for that type of success. Sometimes when I have started to notice that I'm micromanaging someone, which I generally really don't like to do, because I myself don't like to be micromanaged. I think it's really good to explore why that's happening. Is it a performance issue? Is it that you don't trust them? Generally, I actually think it's the, the mentees, um, or sorry, the mentors or the bosses failing to not set out the, the work appropriately, to not give clear instructions, to not um, you know, support that person through their learning. So I think we're reflecting on why am I micromanaging? How can I fix this problem? Um, and trying to get away from micromanaging as much as possible, I, I think is better for everyone. I also have really regular check-ins. I used to do weekly check-ins. Now it's more like every two to four weeks, depending on the role and really checking with the whole person. I think, you know, work is just part of someone's life and people can be going through quite a lot personally um, or professionally or, you know, there's just, there's so much that happens in somebody's life. So I always like to ask people just like, how are you? What's going on in your life? You know, what are challenges? How can I help? 
And you don't need to probe, but I think that sometimes people will share like, you know, my dad's really sick and I'm really worried about him or, you know, I'm, I had a really bad sleep and I'm just like not my best today. And like giving people allowances that, you know, we have good days and we have bad days. And that I think it shows that you care about them as a whole person, not just their work output. And that's really served me well. Um, and then giving and asking for regular feedback related to one of the points in the previous slide. So I always like to give feedback around like something you're doing well, something you can improve. And then I also think that it's important to ask for feedback on your work as well. So if you're giving feedback, also saying, hey, do you have any feedback for me? Anything I can do to improve, make things easier for you, et cetera. And I think that that really sets up a tone of transparency and sharing and, and constant feedback. Um, it doesn't have to be just a one-way street. It can be both ways. And sometimes when I get feedback, I realize that the person is doing something because they feel like they're not being listened to or people don't respect them or people aren't acknowledging their work. And often you can work through those challenges of, oh, okay, if I better support you, then some of these, these weaknesses that I'm seeing will go away. And I found that to be very collaborative. I also think admit and apologize when you made a mistake. And, you know, I, I think that people actually really respect leaders more when a leader says, man, I, I'm sorry, I missed this. I made the wrong call. You know, you know, I, 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 I botched this. We all have bad days. I think that people really appreciate that. I think bosses are sometimes given a bad rap of people that like kind of blame others or, you know, hide their mistakes. And I think it's important to just be really transparent. I also like to ask people questions questions, probing questions. I have this list of great questions. Things like, what would you do if you were the CEO? Or what would you do if you were in charge? And sometimes people have really great ideas. Um, or sometimes they're, um, they're really uh, kind of off base. And it's like a really nice conversation to be like, well, actually, I can't do that because I have shareholders or that's illegal or whatever. <laughs> so I think including them in those conversations and, and really making sure that their voices are heard. And then this is pretty obvious, but encouraging and enabling their growth and promotion. So there's a lot of people that I'll say, you know, to get promoted to a principal or director, we're going to need to see X, Y, and Z. And I even share the rubric and share where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. And I think that that builds, helps build trust and, and shows that you really have their back. Um, and then just keeping the lines of comps open, being responsive, considering their input, and then having fun. I mean, these are people that you spend so much time with maybe eight or 10 or 12 hours a day. And I think that, you know, you can, you can be friendly with them and have fun with them and trust them. And they become kind of like your work family and friends and team. So we do a lot of like the group, this is a group bike ride and group activities. And I actually look forward to a lot of my one-on-ones with my reports because of the really you know nice relationship that we've developed over time. I know I'm probably over time here. Do I have time to tell you guys a little bit about Swarm or should we go into the questions? Oh, you definitely have time. Okay, cool. Okay, so hard pivot over to Swarm. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, um, yeah, just Swarm and what we're doing and where we're going. Um, so the challenge that we're trying to solve with Swarm is that there is this explosion of IoT, Internet of Things devices. These are basically any sort of asset on the planet that could be a sensor or device through agriculture, logistics, and the maritime application, in the energy space, environmental monitoring, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these devices do great sensing, but unfortunately don't have any way to connect back to the internet. So we are, we are, we are putting up um, a network to solve for the fact that only 10% of the Earth's surface area and 35% of land area has a terrestrial connectivity solution, generally cell. So we're solving for the other 90% of the Earth's surface that lacks connectivity today. And our mission is to connect people and devices anywhere at all times at the lowest cost. Um, and we're putting up a network. You can see the photo of what this will eventually look like. We have really simple hardware and data pricing. We right now have 120 satellites. We'll have 150 by the end of this year. And we have easy to buy and integrate hardware. This is what the satellites look like. You saw the one before in my hand. These are kind of renderings. 
as you know, they're really tiny. We have really innovative ways to do communications through some advanced uh, radios and antennas. Um, we try to build our satellites in a really simplistic way. It's like a basically like one board type of design that we build into the box. And we make sure that everything is really durable with radiation tolerant components. We've done a lot of testing in our lab and then in space as well to ensure that this works. And we've iterated really rapidly. I think we're on our ninth or 10th version of our satellite. Um, and we're actually launching uh, five more times this year. Um, and we continue to iterate on that design. There's a lot of different industries that we support. Um, our solutions are vertical agnostic, so they can go in any of these. These are some of my favorites. So critical comms in a New Zealand application, detecting wildfires with this dryad solution in the middle. And then we do oceanic monitoring as well. Um, and many other verticals that are listed at the top and you can check out at our website, swarm.space. Here's one uh, cool application. Um, this is a system that weighs cattle. The cattle put their two front feet or legs on the machine and it can guesstimate the mass of the cow. And that's really important to monitor their health. Um, and these often go into really remote locations in the Australian outback. So we were able to allow this customer to save 6X relative to previous solutions Swarm is generally 10 to 20 X less than existing satellite. So customers are very excited to switch over and then they're able to expand their market opportunity by two X. Another company that we work with is SweetSense. The founder is actually also Canadian and was also in the Canadian um, astronaut tryouts that I was a part of, his name is Evan. They monitor uh, water and air quality in Africa and then also expanding to California to help with drought management. And they're able to 10x their market opportunity with Swarm. They were using Iridium previously. And that's all I've got for you guys. So any questions? Oh, I see some in the chat. Oh, and it looks like, oh. Sorry, I'm not sure how you feel about, um, given the size, how do you feel about if I unmute everybody, everyone stays muted, and then they can put their hand up and ask the question directly? Um, Sounds great. Yeah, okay, well, we'll try that. And if that doesn't work, then we can do the uh, Q&A through the chat, but it might be more personable if people can ask them themselves. Sure, and I think I can share my video now. Yeah, I know, I think I, I think I got it working. <laughs> oh, no, it's still not letting me oh. unblock. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. We uh, tried. <laughs> I'm wearing my Swarm shirt. <laughs> oh, one second. Should I read the ones in the chat to start with? Um. Yeah, that would be great, actually. Okay. Um, can you speak to your grad school experience and becoming confident enough to take the leap of faith to become an entrepreneur starting Swarm? Oh, that's a loaded one. Um, I actually had a really tough grad school experience. Um, and I think a lot of people do and people don't really talk about it. Maybe I should have talked about it in my presentation. I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, I think like the rates of anxiety and depression in grad school are like alarmingly high. And there's not a lot of resources for grad students. Uh, my professor was not great. And um, I didn't feel like I had the support of him or the department for a lot of my grad school. So that really sucked. Um, and that I think really actually takes a toll on your confidence. Like I remember before defending my PhD, like waking up in night sweats, but like I was gonna fail. And I think that's actually really common. <laughs> so don't be freaked out if that happens to you. Um, and then I was like shell shocked that the other people on my committee, like thought my research was good. <laughs> and they were like, this was great. This was one of the best defenses I've seen. I was like literally shell shocked because my confidence was pretty low at that time. Um, so I think trying to find first an advisor that's going to be really supportive of you is really important. And then for me, I actually ended up finding like a co-advisor who was super, super supportive and actually was a woman. And she really helped me finish. I don't think I would have finished without her. So I had kind of co-advisors co, um, uh, by the end. So I think seeking out those opportunities um, and you know, mentors can be people that are like your age or slightly older or professors. So trying to build up that network. And then I think from there on out, I had way more supportive um, 
bosses and stuff like that when I was at JPL and when I was at Google X. So that definitely helped me. And then the fact that I was able to pitch my own in entrepreneurship opportunity for a kind of a new idea at Google X also really helped me build my confidence. So I don't think that it's any one thing. I think it's, you know, it's just taking risks and trying to find supportive environments um, and continuing to seek out additional support if you need it. Um, but it's definitely a journey and it's something I'm still working on. I still struggle with massive imposter syndrome. I'll like run a meeting and afterwards be like, I'm so dumb. And people will be like, no, you're not. That was great. Um, so I think it's something that's a, it's a, it's a lifelong thing. Um, and I think we're usually a lot better than we think we are <laughs> is kind of my takeaway. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, a really good point. I'm, I'm a student <laughs> myself and definitely yeah. imposter syndrome is something that me and yeah. all my peers struggle with. So it's, that's really good advice. Yeah. I'll, I'll often like, yeah, I still like have major issues and my co-founder will be like, you literally sold a company. You need to like give yourself <laughs> some credit. So I think, and I've heard this thing, like it doesn't ever go away. You just start playing on a new playing field every time you kind of advance in your career. Um, so just to, to add on that really quickly then, so you, after your PhD, when you got all this amazing positive feedback about your dissert dissertation and your research, and then you went to Google X, how did you feel once you, once you got into a more of a, um, I guess that working environment within Google X? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was first at JPL and I had some really good bosses and people that I worked for and with there that made me feel like, okay, I'm valuable. My work is good. Um, and that definitely helped me improve my confidence. And then I also had a really good boss at, um, at Google X and Project Wing, and he was also really supportive. So I think like, honestly, it probably took me like three or five years to recover from grad school to the point where I was like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm smart. I can contribute meaningfully to these programs. I'm ambitious. I get shit done. And then, only then was I able to look back and say, oh, my advisor was wrong. It wasn't me. And it took me a long time to like realize that. Um, you can hear the emotion in my voice because like it was very, very difficult. I think I actually have PTSD from like grad school. <laughs> Not to scare all of you guys. I'm sure you'll have a better experience. Just pick your advisor wisely. Um, so oh, okay, the next yeah, so the next question is, how do you, how do you ask about or look for some of the important cultural components you just mentioned as you're looking at a job slash career opportunity? Yeah, I think that that is, um, it's sometimes challenging to know before you join, but I think that the easiest way is if you have a friend that already works there, just being like, Hey, like, what is it really like? Um, and then I think you can learn a lot through an interview process, especially if you're able to actually go on on site. I know that's hard with COVID, but people are kind of getting back to that. So go and like talk to everyone you can at the company um, and get their take. Um, and then I think like, you know, the reputational things like, you know, Google is like really cushy and there's free lunches and it's like kind of like fun and laid back. like that's actually true and then like spacex is like pretty hard driving and like some people are super intense and people work 60 or 80 hours a week that's also true um so i think that like the the reputational stuff you hear about there's generally like some truth in it but then every group and every like experience and every project is kind of different so I think asking probing questions in your interview, like, you know, what is the best part of this culture? What is the worst part of this culture? Um, don't be scared to ask questions like that. Or like, you know, why did the last person that left the company leave? Like, what's the honest reason? Um, or like, what aspects of the culture are you trying to work on here? Um, and I think that if you, I think that you can tell if you're getting an honest answer, you can probe a little bit more. Um, but, but I think the kind of like general sweeping comments about like academia versus government versus a small startup versus a bigger company are generally true with respect to like, um, life work balance and how rigorous versus speedy and like how collaborative people are. 
Um, but yeah, I would just ask probing questions of your manager and of your peers. And when you're interviewing, you can also ask like, hey, can I talk to like the admin or the office assistant or the intern or like the some of the most junior or, or kind of like lowest level people will, will have the most kind of like reality to share with you. So you can always ask to talk to more people at the company. I, I would encourage you to do that as well. Yeah, that's really good advice. So the next one, uh, when eyeing your potential for growth in a certain position, how do you balance the weight of doing your boss's job with how you might do your boss's job your own way? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely, yeah, like had bosses where I'm like, hmm, I would do your job differently. <laughs> um, I think it is important to realize like what's important at this company and will that be valued? So let's say you're thinking, wow, if I was my boss, I would spend way more time investing in, um, in the people in this company. And I would do like weekly one-on-ones and give feedback and help mentor them more. Um, but if you're in an environment where that isn't valued, like, you know, like even like a SpaceX where it's like speed is kind of the, a key aspect of, of what we're trying to do that may actually not be the best like place for you to be long-term if that's what you really, really value. Um, so I think what, what are the high level like company goals and what is valued in this organization and would my way of doing it be better or worse? And very likely it is better and hopefully it's valued, but that'll also help you kind of have a metric for whether or not that is a place that you should be long-term, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so moving to a couple more like logistical questions, some people are interested about Swarm and if there's an opportunity to join, join Swarm at this point, um, how do you get involved? Can you get involved with Swarm? Um, yeah. Yeah, so we are definitely hiring. Um, honestly, most of our roles require a few years experience. So I'm not sure there's probably some people on this call where that would be appropriate. So I would suggest going to the SpaceX careers page. Let me see if I can, I think if you just Google SpaceX careers, you can find it. And if you put swarm into the search bar, it will actually bring up all of the open swarm positions. Yep, I just did. So spacex.com slash careers, and then punch swarm into that window. Um, and we're in Mountain View. So most of our roles are Mountain View. Some of them are a bit flex and then if you're looking for an internship opportunity, there is also a SpaceX internship application that you can put through. Um, and we see some of those interns, so if they're appropriate. So that could also be a way. Um, if you're just like, hey, I am like an amazing electrical engineer or software engineer, and I really wanna talk to you, Sarah, about how I can join Swarm, you could also just email me. Maybe I can, Please, everyone, don't email me at the same time, but here, I'll put my email in the chat. <laughs> and um, I am happy to try to figure out if there's an opportunity for you, even if it's maybe not on the site right now. We're always looking for amazing talent. Um, and we, I love having more diverse people. I think that's super important. So, um, and I love Canadians. There's visa issues that people are Canadian, we should talk through. It's important to have at least an H1B, but we can work through those details as needed. Yeah, I think, i sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to add, I think the fact that you were so willing to talk to people, like just even the idea that you responded to my LinkedIn about doing this was really amazing, inspiring. And it kind of leads into where do you find the time? <laughs> time management, well, like how are you able to find the time to mentor and help people and be, you know, the CEO of Swarm, a scientist at SpaceX? Like, <laughs> well, I do work a lot. I don't, I don't mean to, um, yeah. I think that like, you know, all of my career, I have worked a lot, a lot. Like we're talking like 60 to hundred hour weeks like since undergrad basically um and that's it's a lot of early mornings and late nights and I work most weekends and all of that so I, it does take a lot of work I, I think you had a compelling message because I get a lot of messages like that <laughs> so good job 
um, you also probably caught me like right time, right place. Um, and I, I always love to give back to women and Canadians and this seems like a good opportunity. So I think you just hit a lot of the, the check boxes. Um, I often feel very like scrambled between things like today, I, this morning, I was like, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to put my presentation together. And you know, it's a little bit frantic. Um, and I, you just gotta kind of prioritize and you know, try to get stuff done. A lot of days I feel like, man, I didn't even finish the main thing I was trying to get done, but we have to give ourselves grace, I think, and realize we worked as hard as we could. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I also, like, I don't have kids yet. So I think that I, that is an additional challenge that I know a lot of people have that I, I think I'm just in awe that they, you know, run companies and have little kids running around and stuff. So maybe that too. <laughs> Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, definitely an additional challenge. Yeah, and some people do it, so I don't know. We should ask them for advice. Yeah, definitely. Um, so next question: uh, Did you find that there's any difficulties moving between academia, industry, and government because you've dabbled in all of them? Yeah, I mean, I think I I was pretty lucky in that my previous experiences were seen as valuable when I moved on to the next experience. So. Um, it's very normal for academics to go to government, you know, like a lot of people at JPL were have masters or PhDs. So that was very natural. And that's actually how I first had the opportunity through that network. Um, and then uh, when I went to Google X, they were actually looking for people that had kind of like a NASA level rigor systems engineering. So that actually helped me a lot for that specific role, maybe in other instances, they would be like, oh, she, you know, they're going to be slow or not used to our speed of innovation. But that was actually really seen as a, as an advantage into that role. Um, and also I was a pilot, which was just like kind of a weird aside, but allowed me to kind of bridge from the space world, which I'd been in previously to an aerospace, you know, drones. And then when I started Swarm, um, my co-founder also has academia industry and he sold a start one startup at that point. So I think that investors were like, wow, these people have been everywhere and seen all of the ways that things are done in academia, in government, in industry, in startups. And again, that was seen as a pro. So I think I was very lucky in that sense. Um, I think it can sometimes be challenging. Like, you know, I know that at SpaceX, we really like people that come from startups because they have that very scrappy background. But I think if you're at a bigger company, you're still able to show that you are, you know, you're advancing rapidly. Or if you leave because you're like, it was too slow for me, I think that that's a pretty good indication that you're someone that like values speed and innovation. Um, so yeah, I think it's very situation dependent, but I had a very, very positive experience um, just through my kind of transitions. Yeah, I think it, it is interesting. Everyone does have very different experiences. Some say that once you get in one, you can't transition to the other. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear that. Yeah. Um, for the next one, so how will you how will you advise someone who really wants opportunities, but their culture and environment limits them in one way or another? Hmm. That's tough. Mm -hmm. I guess I would question, you know, what is limiting them, and is that like a real limitation? Like sometimes just like a bad boss, like my grad school experience can feel like it's limiting you. But what if you were to switch to a different group and have a different boss? Maybe that alleviates the issue. Um, or maybe, you know, you're, you know, pigeonholed working on code all day and you're someone that prefers interaction. So if you're able to move more into like a systems role where you'd be interacting with people either inside the company or outside more, that would be more fulfilling for you. So I would, I guess I would drill into like, what about it is limiting. And then it, if it truly is just like, you know, I want to move fast and everybody else is moving slow, or I want to be rigorous and everyone else is, is, you know, being cowboys over here, maybe question, is this the right culture for me long-term? And should I maybe look for an opportunity for something new? And I think especially young people, I think it's really natural for people to switch jobs every two, three, four, five years. And I don't think that we should feel shame about it. I think we should see it as I'm growing, I'm figuring out where I want to fit, I'm gaining new experiences, I am being agile. And I think that that is a positive thing. Like I just had a woman actually leave SpaceX and Swarm, which is kind of sad, but she had gotten 
really far in her career and she wanted to go a different direction than when we were going and it was a super respectful transition and I think so positive for her and I'm so happy and supportive of her and it was this really good growth thing so I think that that can happen um, where it's just like you know I'm actually looking for something else or I'm I want to grow in this direction and that's like totally okay and more common you know I think at least my parents generation they like stayed in the same job for 30 years I think that that just is not what's happening these days and we shouldn't feel shame around it we should just see it as opportunities for growth <clears throat> yeah I think I think that's it's definitely not the same as it was generations ago we're going to go through a lot of different jobs um, I want to end it out with one last question that I think is really great because it, when it comes down to mentorship, um, it's a common a common problem. It's sometimes mentors don't always see the the benefit in having a mentee. So how do you think a mentee can also be relevant and beneficial for a mentor? Um, sometimes you know you feel like as a mentee you're you're taking too much time and you are you know aren't necessarily benefiting the mentor. So I'm curious what you think about that and advice you would say being in a mentee and a mentor role in your career. Yeah, that's a cool one. Um, I think that some of the people that I mentor, either like formally or informally, actually give me a lot of energy back. Um, either because like, I'm, I'm just like, no, they're going to go on to great things. And I'm just like, so excited to cheerlead them through that. Um, or they're, they're just really um, like, they're just like, that's great advice. Thank you so much. They're just so grateful and appreciative. And for me, it's like, it's so easy to talk and reflect on my experiences. Like doesn't, doesn't hurt my brain or anything. I'm just like, hey, I did this. Maybe it'll work for you. It's so easy for me. And to see it make such a big impact to their lives, um, especially when they find it really validating. Like I'm like, hey, your boss isn't you treating you right. You need to advocate for yourself. And they are just like, oh, thank God. Thank you so much for telling me this. Like it's a, a weight off their shoulders. Or I'm like, I believe in you. You should go for the next thing. You should be promoted or you should apply here. I think you're going to get it. Giving them that little boost of confidence, I find really rewarding. And so I, I actually find that, you know, when you find that good mentor-mentee relationship, it can be really rewarding and give a lot of energy to the mentee. At least that's been my experience. And I wouldn't worry about taking too much time. I think a way to do it really respectfully is like, you know, I have a quick question. Can I chat for you with you for five minutes? Like everybody has five minutes. And then just be like, it's been five minutes. Thank you so much for your time. I want to be respectful and like hang up. And I think that person will start to realize like, okay, I can give advice in really small time chunks and this person still sees it as valuable and they respect my time <laughs> and then I think they're going to be willing to give you that again if you need it hello hello can you still hear me I'm sorry I mine cut mine cut out okay <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and specifically you, Sarah, for, for giving us this time and for inspiring everybody on this call. I can't thank you enough for, for doing this for us. Um, if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to um, email them to me. I'll put them in the I'll put it in the chat. And again, don't don't swarm Sarah with emails, but she has all her, <laughs> you know, be there have a, a burning a burning uh, question <laughs> or need I appreciate I appreciate the pun yeah if you, if you need me I'm there for you guys but please don't all email me at once that'll be overwhelming <laughs> thanks right. everyone great thank questions you so much. have a wonderful weekend you too bye for now bye